And yes, uh, good day to everyone <laughs> once again. So thank you for joining us today uh, for the second lecture in our uh, aviation lecture series. My name is Kelvin. Okay, I'm from the Asia campus of uh, Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. And with us today is uh, Dr. Jack Patel, and he will be presenting on the topic on uh, Freakonomic, okay, what determines the supply and demand for the aviation industry. So this session today is the second in a series of six lectures designed to break down the world of aviation into bite-sized pieces uh, that are easily understandable. So if you have yet to register yourself for the remaining sessions, you can still do so as the registration uh, is still open. So before we hand this over to Dr. Jack, we will just uh, like to remind you of the following guidelines for the session. So first of all, uh, please, you know, keep your microphone on mute okay, uh, when the speaker is presenting. Okay, uh, so you do not want to interrupt him. If you have any questions that you would like to ask, please use the raise your hand function and wait for the speaker to give the go ahead before, you know, asking your questions. And also, okay, uh, at the end of this session, uh, if you have any questions uh, regarding our programs, the university, or on admissions, okay, I'll be glad to stay on to uh, actually address those questions. Uh, you can also contact us uh, using the contact information that you see now on the screen as well. And of, and of so, you can actually follow, follow us on our social media to get our latest news and updates from the university. So now uh, I'll just like to hand this over to Dr. Jack. And there we go. Over to you, Jack. You can share hey, your screen now. Thank you. Thank you, Kelvin. Okay. So welcome everybody. Um, this is my session today on um, free economics. And uh, what I want to show you is the beautiful world that I live in. Now, um, I'm hoping that you are all signing in from various countries and uh, you're all excited for today's session. Um, I I'm your host, Dr. Jack Patel from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Asia. And it's my pleasure to actually see you all virtually today. And hopefully we can see you one day in reality in our classroom. So um, let's do this. Are you guys all set? Ready? Steady? Go. All right. So free economics, everyone. What determines the supply and demand for the aviation industry? It's such a key question. And this cat that you're looking at right now, he has this to say to us, a little bit of wisdom. He adheres, which means sticks to, the law of supply and demand. Well, why is that? Why does a cat know about supply and demand? Well, think about it. You supply the treats and I demand more as a cat, right? The more treats, the more demand. The more you supply, the more the cat demands. So this is just something I want to show you just because um, this gives you an everyday example in case you are new to this area. So here we go. We're going to start nice and easily. So coming up in my session today, I just want to show you um, a quick welcome introduction, uh, a bit about who I am, who we are. Then we go into the theory of supply and demand, which is fun. I promise you it's fun. <laughs> and then we look at some insights and applications to supply and demand. We look at how COVID-19, this crazy time we are living in, how has this affected supply and demand? And then we'll have a chance for lots of interactions, not just at the end, but during this entire session today with me. So I will take you through uh, for about an hour and a half today. So let's have some fun, everyone. So before I start the content, I just want to let you know a bit about me. Um, back then, um, I used to travel the world a lot, got on many flights, got to many airports, luckily, and I got to live in some really cool places doing what I do, which is teaching you guys. I've worked a lot at international schools uh, where you are currently at, hopefully, um, a lot of you. So um, imagine I'm just your teacher at school, basically. And about where have I traveled and where have I been? So the top left picture is interesting. Does anyone know where this might be? Um, if, if you do know, you could just give me a thumbs up or raise your hand. Just show me an emoji if, if you know exactly where this might be, top left. Okay, interesting. So we've got a few people raising their hands already. This is great. Um, this place here is where I was born and raised. 
and uh, I know, yeah, you, you guys have probably been there. And I've got another clue here. Um, do you see this symbol here? Yep, you might know this team. Uh, this team is from the same city, and this is my home team of Arsenal. And Arsenal are based in London. So you guys have got that correctly, the ones that have raised your hands. I know that you're dying to say London. That is the place that I was born and raised my entire life. But after that, I got a bit bored and I wanted to explore a bit, see some sights, experience some different food, some different culture. So where did I go next? I hopped on a plane and I went to the second picture you see on the top right. This picture here is another city in an exotic location. They have a different writing style there. It's not in English, some of the words that you can see, some of the characters. So which country can this be? Really crowded. They love their neon signs. Um, this is a city that I lived in for one year. Does anyone know where this is? Raise your hand, show me an emoji. Great, wow, okay. Excellent. I see a lot of hands going up, like 15, 16 people all putting your hands up. Excellent. The answer here, mm, okay, I'll reveal that to you in a minute, okay? But let's move on to our third picture, and then I will give you all the answers. So the third picture is on the bottom left. This place is full of sand, as you can see. If you love sand castles, go here. It's the best place to build a sandcastle, get the most epic sandcastle action here. Um, not much else apart from sandcastles. So um, it's, it's a fun place to be for a couple of years. I spent two years here. Does anyone know where that might be? You can raise your hand at this point for picture number three. Where is this exotic place with lots of sand? Okay, I see lots of hands going up again. We got like 15, 16 people. They might have this answer. Okay, I will reveal it to you shortly. And um, over here, the last picture now, the bottom right, you can see there is a place. And, you know, I've just revealed it to you because you've seen it on TV. You've seen the fireworks come from the tallest building in the world in Dubai. I was there for three years at an international school. So it was really fun traveling to all these exotic places. If you got the second picture, congratulations. That was Osaka in Japan. It's the second city um, of Japan. A massive, beautiful place. Lots to do, lots to see, lots of entertainment. Karaoke until midnight. It's the place to be. Bullet trains flying above you and around you. It's, it's so fun. Um, and the sand place, where is that? It was a place called Bahrain. Bahrain is, is a place in the Middle East next to Saudi Arabia. And um, yeah, it's, it's a small island, just like my next place, which is Singapore. This is where I am now. It's called the Little Red Dot. Singapore, I know some of you have been there. Some of you have seen it on TV, you've visited for a holiday maybe. It's, it's a great place to be because it's, in the, it's, it's a hub. You're kind of in the middle of everywhere in Southeast Asia, which is a great place to connect to. So um, this is my family here. Uh, I've got um, a couple of little monsters now. Uh, the one on the left that I'm carrying, his name is Aaron. He's two years old and um, he takes after his mummy. So he's a very good looking boy. On the right hand side, I've got Andre. He's almost going to be four years old now. So we are passing the terrible twos, the terrific threes, and the fabulous fours. Uh, it just gets better and better. So um, you might hear them screaming from time and again because they're outside right now. Um, I'm locked into my safe room. This is where I operate from. So, and that's my lovely wife, Nadia. She's also a professor at the university um, in Singapore. So um, yeah, we, we are staying here and we really enjoy our experience so far. So I'm hoping that we can share lots with you during my session. So speaking of sharing, it's, it's really important to share. What I want you guys to do now is I want you to grab your smartphone or even type in the URL that you can see now. This URL is also available in the chat area. So you can even click it in the chat. You will see it right at the top of the chat box. 
So if your QR code function works on your camera, please get your smartphone, point your QR code, and you will be able to open the website. Okay, so the website will look like this. Now, once you enter, I will give you a bit of time. Um, I won't rush you, but I want you to hit the plus buttons that you can see circled in red. I want you to go to this Padlet, which is called Our Space. Um, pardon the pun, there's planet, so it's space in here. Yeah, it's literally space. This is Our Space. Um, I want you to click on the plus button and tell me where are you for number one? Where am I? Answer question one for me. When you've done that, look at question two. What's my ambition? What do you want to be in the future maybe? Uh, what is it you want to do? Where do you want to end up? What do you see yourself in maybe 20, 30 years? What is it you want to do? What is your mission in life? So I wrote my example there to make the world a better place. You know, that's just one example. You can add yours, please feel free. And we will share these um, by, um, and I'll show you the answers come up later on. Also, as we're starting this session, it'll be interesting to know how you feel. So how do I feel? It's a question that you can type now, the answer. You might be a bit nervous, you might be excited, you might be wondering what's going on. Put down your feelings now, okay, as in this stage. So question one, two, and three, you can start to fill in now. I'll give you some time. So please enter this area and contribute to our space. Okay, we'll save question four for later. And there's also question five that you will find that will help you during this session. Okay, so what I will do is um, I'm going to um, see um, how well you are doing with that. So let's just share my screen there. So I see some of you have actually wrote your answers in. Okay, some people are exhausted already. Uh, some people want global peace. Some people feel relaxed. Um, this is great, just keep them coming. You wanna learn everything. A lot of you want to be engineers or pilots, I see, um, in the Air Force maybe. This is great stuff. And um, live life to the fullest, how's that? That's great. Where are you signing in from? Let's have a look. We have lots of people in Singapore, Mumbai, Philippines, Myanmar, India. This is great. Dubai, oh wow. This person got the answer correct, hopefully, for that picture. Um, Dubai, yes, Chennai, LA, wow, this is great. The time zone in LA is minus 12. No, no, more than that, right? So, okay, this is very interesting. Okay. Oh, wow, this is great. And um, the coolest thing you've learned today, you've actually learned something today. How, how amazing is that? We just started, but you've actually learned stuff. Um, okay, and we're gonna add to this. <laughs> the malleability of aluminum, wow. You guys, you guys are so funny. Uh, now I know why I, um, why I taught at international school for three years. You guys kept me entertained so long. So let me just go back to our page and then we'll start the presentation. So we'll, we'll continue with that, okay, throughout. So uh, as you can see, we will always revisit our space. All right, so start a task. Uh, we're gonna start with a poll first of all. What is economics in your view? It's something that you might have studied or something that you might not have studied. But what I want you to answer is this. What image comes into your mind first when you think of the word economics? Okay, so let me put up this poll for you now. I've got four possible choices that you will see on your screen. In terms of what is economics? What do you think? Uh, and we will see the majority of answers if you can get this correct or not. Okay, so is it the study of money? Money makes the world go round. Money can't buy love. Is it the study of money? The study of human behavior, interesting. 
some people think it's a study of human behavior, how humans behave with each other, with money, with the economy, possibly. Or is it the study of banks? The study of banks, where you're looking at commercial banks, central banks, HSBC, for example. You know, there's so much stuff out there. Or is it the last one? Scarcity. What is scarcity? The study of scarcity. Scarcity could be something which we don't have enough of, maybe. So we don't have enough, um, we don't have enough um, beer in the world or green tea, maybe. Uh, we don't have enough money in the world. We have some people that don't have, um, you know, things like iPads or iPhones. Um, is it the f study of things that could be running out? Like oil, for example. Oil could be running out in the very near future or in 40, 50 years from now. There's so many different predictions for oil. So I want you guys to think about this question and put down your answers. I'll give you a bit more time to vote. I've got 77 of you responded so far. So let's see. Okay, I'll give you 10 more seconds. All right, so get your votes in. And um, it looks like, okay, I'm gonna end this poll now. It looks like, wow, let's share the results. <laughs> All right, so hopefully you can see this. The study of money came on top, which is very interesting because a lot of people, when they picture economics, they think of dollar bills, they think of notes, they think of coins, they think of credit cards, they think of money, which is a good answer. But actually, do you know the real answer for this question? Is not the study of human behavior, is not the study of banks, but it's the study of scarcity. Scarcity, 38% of people got that. So well done, guys. Um, that was really, really well done. And um, yeah, so what, what I will do there is I will tell you now a little bit more about the concept of scarcity. So here we go. This is what you are probably thinking, right? <laughs> um, you're probably like this little girl in the classroom thinking, oh, Boring economics, what am I doing? I'd rather be sleeping right now. I'd rather be doing anything but this. Or you were thinking of graphs. Graphs, we use a lot in economics to show trends, to show profits going up and down, GDP going up and down and stuff. We even use the bottom left here, which is the market diagram. You've probably seen this before, supply and demand. Don't worry if you don't know it, we're gonna go into that soon. Maybe the majority of you were thinking of the bottom right, which is money. This here is the rupee, the Indian rupee, but money in general, right? Um, it's something that people think about when discussing economics for the first time. So good guesses, everyone. And I really like that you participated really well. So thank you all for that, Paul. So let's go on to what actually is economics. If you look at a textbook definition, or our trusted Wikipedia, it will tell you the study of how limited resources are best used to satisfy our unlimited wants. What does that mean? Well, think about what you had for lunch today um, or for breakfast. You might have a $5 bill in your pocket. That $5 bill is your pocket money. It's limited. It's a thing that you have. It's a resource that can be used. Now, how will you spend that $5 on your lunch today? Or how did you spend it on your lunch today? This is how you have to think about your choices and what you are giving up to get your choice, to get your needs met. So for example, I have so many wants for lunch. I want fish and chips. I want um, curry and rice. I want um, naan bread. I want kebabs. I want noodles. I've got unlimited wants for my lunch because I'm a, I'm a foodie. I love food like many of you guys are, right? Hands up if you're a foodie. Yep, okay. <laughs> Put your hands up now. Yeah, we've got so many foodies in the house. I like it. Food is what makes our life great. So we have unlimited wants when it comes to food. So what I want you to know is you got a limited $5 bill in one hand but the choices for your lunch are endless. 
this is an example of economics. How can I use that $5 to get the best lunch possible for me? And the best lunch possible for me might be different to what's the best lunch for you because our tastes are different. Our preferences are different. I like spicy food. I don't know if you love spicy food. Maybe you do. But this is what makes economics cool because it allows us to discuss, it allows us to debate, and it allows us to compare. And that is what we really love to do in this topic. And that's why I love teaching this subject because our classes are never boring. They're never dull. So many viewpoints, so many preferences, so many actions can come about. So economics is about studying how your limited resource can be used to make you really happy. Okay, that is the bottom line. I thought it was all about supply and demand when I first started in this job. And Thomas Carlyle, he's an interesting guy. He was based in Scotland during the 1800s. Teach a parrot the term supply and demand and you've got an economist. That's what he said. What does he know? He's actually a famous philosopher way back in the day before any of us were born, Thomas Carlyle. He also said something mean about economics. Thomas Carlyle said, economics is a dismal science. What does dismal mean? Does anyone know what the word dismal means? How do you feel today? I feel great. I feel dismal. What does dismal mean? Raise your hand if you know the meaning of dismal. Okay. Okay, interesting. Dismal is probably the opposite of the way I'm feeling right now. Dismal is when you have a really sad face. Dismal is something which is miserable. It's something like the weather in Scotland where Thomas Carlyle grew up. Why did he say this? Why did he say economics is not a happy science, a sad science? Why did he say this? Let's think about it. I've got a hint here at the bottom for you. Think about what the world was like in the 1800s. So I want everyone to do this for a moment. Just close your eyes. Close your eyes with me and imagine for 10 seconds, what was the world like in the 1800s? No internet. No TV, no Snapchat, no TikTok, no Facebook, nothing. No microwave. How do you heat up food? Water supply might be dirty or scarce. You might have to walk miles just to get water. Schools were very different. They weren't as fun and interactive as it is now. There were places where you were punished sometimes with a cane. So I'm thinking life was pretty miserable for this guy. Poor Thomas. Did he have a negative outlook? Because this is what he was facing. Lots of poverty, lots of crime, bad weather, worse food, England, garbage, things piling up. It wasn't a really clean place with sanitation or healthcare. It wasn't really education. This wasn't really accessible for some people. So imagine, I think I'm starting to understand his viewpoint now. I get him. I get Tommy. I get it now. But econs can also be fun, cool, and useful. That's what we have to understand these days. So let me show you in this lesson, in this crazy lesson that I have with so many people in my classroom, let's show you how econs can be fun, cool, and useful. Check this out. What is aviation economics? Aviation economics is what we are learning today. You will have the real chance here to learn something different today. We're going to learn a little bit about economics in general, a bit of the theory, and then we're going to apply it to aviation and the world around us. Planes, airports, cargo, whatever. We're going to apply it to COVID-19. We're going to take what's in the book and bring it alive. And that is what I love about this subject. It brings a life to something which was on paper and it might have appeared so boring to you. But let's show you how it can be awesome and applicable 
to the world of aviation, which is a really exciting place to be. So what we're going to do now, we're going to learn aviation economics, but in two simple steps. Okay, are you guys ready for this? All right, raise your hand if you're ready to learn aviation economics in just two simple steps. So easy, right? All the hands are flying up now, I see. You are all ready, you're all excited. I think it's time to do this. All right, here we go. Thanks, guys. Step one is theory. We will learn a bit about that first because without theory, you cannot apply the theory. So, excellent guys, here we go. This is what I wanna teach you today, first of all. What is demand and what is supply? We hear about it all the time for econs. So let me explain this to you now. Demand is the quantity of a good or service a buyer, like us, a consumer, is willing and able to purchase at a given price over a given time period. So think about it. We are all consumers, we are all demanders. It is the amount of a good, amount of a product that you are wishing and willing and able to buy at a given price over a given time. That time period could be one day, one week, one month. But how much, how many iPhones are you willing to buy? This year, maybe one. Okay, but how many um, teas are you willing to drink in one day? Maybe I'm willing to demand three teas in one day at the price of $1 maybe. Why not? I love tea. Yep, so demand could be applied to any product as you can see, any price point, any time period. But the key thing guys is willing and able. You have to be willing to buy it and you have to be able to buy it. So you need the money in your wallet. So imagine a demand is different to a dream. A dream is something that you are willing to have but you are not able to have it because it might be too expensive, for example. Like I'm dreaming of buying a Ferrari, okay? A Ferrari, La Ferrari is a beautiful car, right? Who fills me with that? Does anyone love the La Ferrari? It's such a beautiful car. Yeah, it, it's poetry in motion, right? This is a dream that I have, but am I able to afford this dream? Let me just check. Let me just check my bank account. Okay, there's a lot of zeros, a lot of negatives, a lot of red. Okay, that's not looking good. This Ferrari is a dream, my friends. Okay, so it's not a demand for me. It's a dream for me. So think about dreams and demand as being different because I'm willing to buy it, but I'm not able to buy it. Now, what about supply? Supply, just change a few words around in the demand definition and you've got yourself supply. So as you can see, I've highlighted the words in red to show you what words I have changed from the demand definition. So switch three words only and you get supply. Supply is the quantity of a good or service a seller is willing and able to sell at a given price over a given time period. So think of supply in the mind of a businessman or a businesswoman. Do they want to sell cheap goods? No, people want to sell expensive goods and makes lots of money. They want the price to be as high as possible to make the most money. As a business person, money is king. Money is profit. You want to make profit. So supply is the quantity that a seller is willing to sell at a given price. If the price goes up, they are willing to sell more. If the price goes down, are now able and willing maybe to sell a bit less because it's not motivating to sell something so low in price. The opposite is true for demand. As consumers, we love things that are cheap and good. Cheap and good is high value. That's what we like. I'd rather buy a good cheap car than to buy an expensive car that gives me a headache because I cannot pay it off, right? So if you think about it, Demanders are thinking opposite to sellers. Demanders want cheap and good. Sellers want expensive and good as well. So look at the graph now. Have a look at that graph. This graph, if we 
if we make a graph of price on the y-axis and quantity on the x-axis, I've called it P for price, Q for quantity. If you have an axis like that and you plot the suppliers and the way they are thinking, you will start getting the supply line which slopes skywards. That's why it's an S because sky starts with the letter S. It slopes upwards. The higher the price, the more the seller wants to sell in terms of quantity. Makes sense, right? Simple. Supply slopes skywards because the higher the price, the more the seller wants to sell. Easy. You know supply now. What about demand? Demand is how demanders think. The lower the price, the more I want to buy. That's why you can see it slopes downwards from left to right. At a high price, you get less people willing and able to demand. At a low price, all of a sudden, you have lots of people that want to demand the product at a low price. That's why demand slopes downwards from left to right. D is for downwards. D is for demand. So that's the way I remember it. X marks the spot. Supply slopes skywards. Demand slopes downwards. And where does X marks the spot? X is where supply and demand meet. That is where you will see transactions happening. Suppliers are happy to deal. Demanders are happy to do a deal. They shake hands. This is the shake hand point. Everyone's happy. No one's losing out. The price is reasonable, not too low, not too expensive. And the quantity of transactions is QE. That's how many transactions are happening in the marketplace right now for that product. And PE is the equilibrium price or the price at which you are seeing in the market for that product. So you could take that for any product. Let's just do something so easy and common as apples, for example, the fruit, not the iPhone, but the fruit. Fruit, fruit, about, it could be $1 per apple. And at the price of $1, which is the equilibrium price, how many people are willing and able to buy it? How many transactions are happening to buy apples every day? An apple a day keeps a doctor away. So at the price of $1 PE, QE, number of people, are willing to buy the apple. QE could be 10 people per hour, 20 people per day, maybe, in a different country. Or it could even be 1,000 people per week. So QE depends on the time that you are talking about, the time frame. Okay, so a $1 apple, the PE could be $1, but the QE could depend. Is this graph per week, per month, per year? That QE can definitely vary. The transactions for apples could vary depending on your time period. That's why we have to specify time period very carefully in these diagrams. Okay, so if you think about it now, the summary of this is PE and QE are the predicted price or the average price, the average quantity you will see in the market for the product you are discussing right now. You could apply this to airlines. You could apply this to ticket prices. You could apply this to buying a Boeing 737. You could apply this to any product, which is so cool. This diagram is so powerful. And these curves can even move around. So have a look at the top left here. The top left is when supply starts shifting to the right. The top, the, the, the top right is when supply shifts to the left. And as you can see, that applies to demand as well. Demand could shift right, demand could shift left. These diagrams start moving around, which makes it very, very confusing and fun too. But if you follow me, I will explain all of this to you now, and then we will apply it. So what can make supply and demand shift or move? These things are called shifters or determinants because they determine supply or they determine demand. So for example, some things could increase demand. For example, income, as you can see in point number two here, consumer incomes. How does income shift demand? Well, let's go back. If everybody gets rich, all of a sudden, we all get a pay rise of 
50%. What will happen to our demand for stuff? Will it be increasing like this diagram here? Or will our demand for stuff start decreasing like this diagram here? What do you think? If we all get rich all of a sudden, what could possibly happen? I'm guessing we would start buying more stuff. You would start buying the latest gadgets. You will start signing up for the latest experiences. You will start traveling to the craziest, weirdest destinations. It would be so fun. Our demand will start increasing. So an increase in demand is generally going to be this diagram here. That's if we all get rich at the same time, we will start demanding more stuff. The diagram shifts to the right, the demand shifts to the right, and we will start increasing our demands. That's just one example that I want to share with you. Let's share with you a supply example. Imagine if technology moves forward, as you can see in point number three here. Technology is a determinant of supply. So it determines a shift for supply. How does technology impact supply? Well, think about it. What has been happening during this COVID-19 period? We've all had to wear one of these things, right? We've all had to wear something <laughs> on your face, which could be classed as annoying, but it's essential as well, isn't it? So um, what am I referring to, guys? I'm referring to the humble face mask. Okay, we are all wearing this and walking around with this kind of face mask, steaming up our glasses. It's not really comfortable, but it's something that we're living with right now. Now this face mask, we are shifting the supply of something because we need it more and more. Okay, things like Zoom, for example, we're using Zoom so much now. Zoom has increased their supply to the world because the world is relying on Zoom to have classroom lessons, to have fun sessions like what we're doing now. Zoom is enabling people to meet without traveling. So the supply of Zoom has definitely shifted to the right. It's looking like diagram number one here. Okay, so technology sometimes can start shifting things to the right because it changes the way we do business. It changes the way we work. It changes the way we think. So technology sometimes has that impact. Interesting, isn't it? I, I, I find that super. Okay, so um, what we'll do now is let's learn some economics. Okay, so I'll take off my face mask for a start. Okay, it's quite annoying. Can't breathe in that thing. All right, here we go. So uh, what I want to show you is I want to show you these shifters again. Take a look at it. Just have a look at some of the points now. Some things shift demand. Some things shift supply. It could either go left or right. Okay, now let me tell you which way will it go. Left or right. Which curve shifts? And which way does it shift? This is where I want everybody to think in three steps. So put on your smart hat. That's why I put on this hat. It makes me smarter for some reason. It increases my IQ by about plus seven easily. So I'm going to think in three steps right now. Step one, what situation has happened to hit the market? Has it been COVID-19? Has it been a new discovery? Has there been a new aircraft coming on the market? Have they discovered a new oil reserve in the world? What situation has hit the market? That's step one that you have to think about. Step number two is how does this situation affect the supply or the demand for this market? For example, let's just think about they've discovered oil. In Canada, for example, they discovered a new oil supply in Canada under the ground. Would this affect the supply or the demand for oil? Mm, think about the first thing that would happen. The first thing that would happen is the supply of oil from Canada will start going up all of a sudden because they discovered a new oil field in Canada. Okay. 
Eventually, people will say, wow, there's more oil. We could use it now. Let's demand more of it. So then demand will eventually start rising in the future, maybe. But what is the first thing to happen? Think of that for step number two. The first thing to happen is the important thing. So in my view, if they discover a new oil field in Canada, the supply of oil will start to shoot up. So supply will increase. That's my step two. Now, step three is which way does the curve shift? Will the oil curve go left or will the oil curve go right? Which way will it go? Now, I've made a simple rule here that you can see that I've circled because it's so simple but so important. A left shift is usually a bad thing that happens. It results in less supply or less demand. So think of left as less, left as bad. Okay, that's the thing to put into your mind right now. Left is bad, left is left. Less is left, sorry. What about right? A right shift is a positive thing that happens. Something great, something interesting, something fun, something good is a positive change. A positive change makes the curves for supply and demand go to the right. Okay, so let's imagine a positive thing. For example, um, you know, us getting rich at the same time. If we all get rich at the same time, that's a positive thing. That's a good thing, right? There's nothing wrong with that. There's everything good about that. We got more money to spend. That means, will there be more supply or more demand from us? I'm thinking if we get rich at the same time, we will all run to the shops. We will all go online shopping and start going crazy. So there'll definitely be more demand happening in that case. So I'm guessing demand will shift to the right in that case. Okay, that's the first thing that will happen. And eventually shops will realize that we're buying more stuff, that they will start supplying more stuff. So eventually supply will shift to the right too. But let's not confuse things. Let's think of only the first thing that happens in this situation. And that is the one we draw. That is the one we show. So remember guys, this is the theory part, okay? You're doing really well so far. Hands up if you are keeping up with me right now. Hands up, everyone. Simple so far, right? Yeah. Excellent. Now, this is what I like to do, guys. I like to keep things real simple to make sure everybody understands it. But once everybody understands it, we're going to have so much fun applying this stuff. All right? So let's do this, everyone. And bear with me as well. So remember, a market always starts off this way. And X is what you see in every market. Okay? So you see the X. This drawing could represent anything. It could represent laptops, iPhones, cars, aircrafts, services like passenger journeys on a plane. Anything good, anything like a service. Any product in the world could be represented in this diagram right here that you see. Okay, and this is the starting point for every item that you are buying and selling right now. So that is the first thing I want you to remember. The second thing I want you to remember is a shift. A shift is what changes the market. What has caused it to change? Is it a global pandemic? Did that change the market? Is it the market for technology like Zoom, for example, that we are using right now. So this shows you an example of technology maybe that has changed and we are shifting supply to the right for things like Zoom, okay? They are supplying us more Zoom services and we are consuming more Zoom sessions and webinars and virtual classes, okay? The first thing to change though is the technology is there. The technology has to be there to make Zoom happen. So the technology has shifted to the right. We've in enhanced our technology, in other words. Okay, so what is the overall situation now in this diagram? We have moved from A to B, as you can see. Equilibrium A was the previous equilibrium, the old equilibrium. 
But we are now moving on to equilibrium B, which is the new situation, the new market. So let's compare A and B now. A used to have a price of PE and transactions of QE. But when the pandemic struck, we all went online for our learning, maybe schools closed, we all went to Zoom. You notice that they started supplying us more Zoom. So the Zoom price should have fallen to B and the quantity should have increased to the point corresponding to B. Okay, we are making more transactions on Zoom. We are using it more often. And in theory, the price should have fallen. But did the price of Zoom fall in reality? Um, probably not, because Zoom knows that they're becoming more popular. So they can start putting their prices up. And that is their business strategy. But that's what happens way down the line. We're just thinking about the first thing to happen. Okay, so there's an increase in supply of Zoom, basically. All right, is everyone understanding that so far? This is just a recap of the shifts and the market situation. Okay, so please raise your hand if you are all good with that. And if you have any questions, remember guys, feel free to post your questions on our Padlet because we will be looking at those questions and about your feelings and about your comments add those to the Padlet. You can even do that as we are speaking, okay? So you guys love to multitask, I know. So feel free to get your questions on that. So speaking of questions, it will be nice to visit that, okay? So let's just check that out now. Let me go to our space. All right, so let's just scroll down to the questions. Interesting, right? So let's look at number five here. Let's just scroll down. Okay, let's see. Which team do you support in the Champions League? That is a great question and a very important question because the Gunners couldn't make it to the Champions League, unfortunately. Um, but I'm really liking the way that these attractive teams play. So, for example, like PSG, for example, playing good football. They got Neymar. They got great fan following, great stadium. I kind of like them right now. But Bayern Munich are really the team to beat, right? They are playing super stuff. And they wear the same colors as this. So maybe Bayern, who knows, right? Some people said, yes, Bayern, yay. All right, so here we go. Let's do some econs questions as well. So um, interesting, right? Some people want to know my opinions on pineapple pizza. Uh, some people say you just don't go there with pineapple, but I say you go there, pineapple is the bomb. Pineapple makes pizza exotic. With a bit of chili and a bit of pineapple, you got sweet, you got a bit of spicy. It's the best thing, man. I, I love pineapple on pizza. <laughs> you might not agree with me, but oh my God, it's amazing. And in Singapore, we have a fruit called durian. Same kind of thing. You either love it or you hate it. I don't know if you've tried durians before. Can you raise your hand if you've tried a durian before? Um, some hands are going up. Yeah, these might be the ones based in Southeast Asia because um, durian is really popular in Malaysia, in Singapore, in Indonesia, even in China. There's such a big following for durian now. Um, so what are we talking about? Oh yeah, economics and aviation. That's what we are talking about, right? Mm. Okay, so yeah, <laughs> some people's questions got selected. Someone did not understand about equilibrium. Okay, let me explain equilibrium again. Equilibrium, think about it in this way, is the place where supply and demand meet. The only place where supply and demand meet is where the X is right there. Okay, so that means buyers are happy and sellers are happy at this one price. And they are willing to do a deal. They're willing to shake hands at this price. And transactions will happen at this price. So this is the market price you are seeing in the market right now. If you go on Amazon right now, this is the price you are seeing for that iPad that you want to buy. This is the equilibrium price. Equilibrium quantity, on the other hand, is the average number of transactions. How many people are buying and selling iPads right now? Today, right now. That would be the QE for iPads today. Okay, if there were 10,000 people buying and selling an iPad right now, 10,000 
will be your QE for iPads right now. Okay, so QE and PE, think of it as just the averages you are seeing in the marketplace, the average price and the average transactions. I hope that makes sense to you. Now, um, yeah, pe people are saying um, economics is a study of human behavior. That is right, it is, because humans are actually interacting in the economy. So really, human behavior as a study is called anthropology, which is slightly different to economics because that shows more about sociology, how they socially connect. But with econs, we're talking about how humans are connecting with the economy. All right, so it's slightly different. So that's why I put that poll question up, just so you could know the difference between anthropology and economics. Slight difference there. Okay, interesting. Um, I know, right? Italians will not agree with me on that pineapple comment. I'm sorry, any Italians out there? <laughs> it goes against everything that they believe in. And another person asked me, are you a Gujarati, Mr. Patel? And yes, the answer is yes, I am. Uh, my father was actually, um, he was born in Kenya, uh, which is in East Africa, but they are originally from Gujarat, which is a state in India, uh, where the prime minister comes from, I think, Narendra Modi. Um, and they were born and raised there, but then my parents moved to London, and that's when I was born. So even though I am a Gujarati, I've never lived in Gujarat. So um, I've been there for holidays, it's really fun. Lots of sand for sand castles, lots of cows walking around naturally. It's, it's a fun, interesting place. Um, I, I love it there. It's, it's really interesting. Um, okay, let's go on to, um, <laughs> let's go on to passion. What is your passion, it says here. My passion, guys, is really teaching and interacting with you guys. I, I, I love it. This is what I do. I've made a whole life out of this ever since I was, um, well, I was tell you my age, but ever since I was 25, which was a long, long time ago now, um, I've been traveling the world. I've been teaching people just like you, and I've been collecting experiences, some of them good, some of them bad, some of them unique, some of them interesting. And I've really been sharing that with people like you. So that is my passion. And as you know, I love talking. No one could shut me up. Even my parents tried it with sellotape. It just didn't work. My wife even tries it with blue tech. That didn't work either. So um, teaching is definitely my passion. Yes. Good questions, guys. Keep them coming. I really do like this. And um, you, yeah, um, you're asking about Padlet. Yes, it's a free tool. Uh, you can use it. You can sign up. And I'm, and I'm using it for one day just now, and I love it. Uh, some people ask me how much pilots earn. Pilots earn buckets of money. It could be more than $100,000 a year, but you need to go up with the experience levels to, to earn the big bucks you do. It takes a few years and then you will definitely earn a lot of money. A retired pilot told me that in his final year of being a pilot, he earned enough to pay for his entire training to become a pilot. So do you believe it? His last year salary was enough to pay for his complete training to become a pilot. So that shows you the sky is the limit. Okay. Um, interesting. And some guy has asked me here about Arsenal. Have you seen Arsenal play at the Emirates Stadium? Yes, I have. I love watching the Gunners. When I was living in London, I used to go down to the Emirates all the time. It used to be called Highbury, Highbury the Library, because it was so, <laughs> that's when Arsenal were boring. So it was Highbury the Library. And ever since it became Emirates, it became a really fun place to go. I've seen the legends in action, Thierry Henry, Dennis Bergkamp, you name it. These were guys that your parents might know, but uh, yeah, it's a fun place to watch football. Everyone's got painted faces. Everyone's got their shirts on. And then outside you can meet troops and DT from Arsenal Fan TV and you can interact with them, go on YouTube. It's a fun place to be. Uh, okay, enough of that. Let me, let me keep going. Oh God, I talk about the Gunners all day. Um, here we go. All right, so um, this is basically where we've arrived at. And remember guys, a negative situation can hit the market too. So think about this, something bad that has happened that has shifted the market to the left. Left is bad, left is less. So remember the COVID situation, what has it done for the flights that you are seeing for global aviation right now? 
we have seen supply shift to S1. There's a whole new supply curve now at S1 because people are not flying anymore. They might be taking some domestic flights in certain countries, Vietnam, Thailand maybe, but really the supply has shifted to the left because although some flights are happening, the majority of flights are not happening. So supply has way gone to the left from A to B. So what are you seeing happening now? PE was the old price of, of a given flight, you know, from maybe London to Dubai maybe. And now that same flight would cost you a lot more money because that flight has become really rare. The transactions have decreased. So QE has gone down, PE has gone up. We have moved from point A to point B when we're looking at global aviation as a whole. Okay, so COVID-19, obviously, it's a bad thing. It's a pandemic. It's affected lots of people around the world. It's a negative situation. This negative situation makes things shift to the left, as I said previously. So left is bad. Left is negative. That's why we've shifted from S to S1. Supply has gone to the left for aviation services for now but we will bounce back. And that is the point we want to make. Okay. So what we want to do guys is we want to learn about aviation economics. We've done the supply demand part. We've done the graph. We've done the theory, which is the good news. We've done step one. Now we are going to move on to step two. And this is the application stage, the fun stage. So what you've learned now, hands up if you've had fun so far, because that was the boring stage. But hands up if you've had fun so far. Okay, let me see you all raising your hand. All right, wow, this is amazing. So you found the boring part was fun. So what's coming up in the second part is even more fun, because this is where it gets really fun and exciting and applicable to the real world, and you can start using it in your own life. So um, it will help you understand the world a bit better. So let's do this, right? Um, what I want to do now is we will take a quick break. Will five minutes do? I think five minutes will do perfect um, because I want you guys to refresh yourself, go to the bathroom, grab a drink, um, chill out for five minutes, then come back and join me for part two where we apply the economics to aviation. And this is where it gets really fun because not only do we apply it to aviation, we apply it to situations that are happening around you too. Okay, so come back guys in five minutes. I'll see you soon. All right, I'll stop my share and um, I'll bring you back to Mr. Kelvin. Mr. Kelvin. So this All is right. our break. <laughs> Yes, uh, I think it's time for everyone to take a short break. Yeah, I'll be sharing a screen while you guys are having your break. Mm. Just a reminder, okay, uh, we, if you have any questions on the university, on the programs, uh, like careers in aviation, or even like our admissions questions, you know, we'd be glad to stay on after uh, Dr. Jack's presentation to help address some of those questions. So if you want, you have questions for us after that, please feel free, we'll be happy to stay on to answer your questions. Excellent, everyone. So take five. All right, see you in five.
Okay. Hello, everyone. <laughs> we'll start in a few seconds, okay? Excellent. So, everyone, welcome back after the break. All right. So, now we've got the fun part, which is the applying part. So, what we're going to do is I'm going to share my screen and show you the fun parts now. Here we go. So, applying to aviation. Let's have a go. All right. So, th this is a poll, okay? I want you to look at the different scenarios now. Let's do the red one first. How does the market change for face masks because of COVID-19? Now, remember the three stages I talked about? The situation, what changes, and which way does it go? So the situation here is COVID. Um, what changes? Is it supply and demand? Which way does it go? Left or right? So choose one, either supply or demand, and left or right. Okay, so let's have a go now. I'm going to start that poll for you. Um, it should be interesting. All right, are you all ready? Let's launch. Put your answer down, folks. What do you think happens? Wow, this is beautiful. You guys, geniuses. All right, keep voting, guys. I'll keep this on. Keep, keep voting. Doing good, everyone. Doing good. Wow, you guys are like making me smile, hence <laughs> the frame right now. Okay, so well done. I'm seeing that you guys have absolutely nailed this. So I'm going to end that poll and I'm going to share the results, okay? So far, 88% of you got that 100% correct. So well done. Okay, nailed it, in other words. Let's move on to the second poll now. All right, so let's move on. Um, okay, I, I want to show you the yellow question now. The yellow question is about our dear pal, Justin Bieber, okay? Used to be um, <laughs> unliked, but now is liked. So this guy turned it around for himself. So Justin Bieber is on the new advert for Coca-Cola. How does this affect the market for Pepsi? So wait a minute. The situation hit Coca-Cola, but we're talking about Pepsi. So imagine the market for Pepsi, okay? That's what you are thinking in your mind, the market for Pepsi, supply and demand for Pepsi. Okay, let's try this poll now. If Justin Bieber advertises Coca-Cola. Check it out. Interesting so far. Good, good work. Keep them coming. Doing well. Mm. Okay, so we're going to close up in 10 seconds, okay? Keep your answers coming in if you haven't voted already. Uh, but I think we're getting the general trend. Okay, here we go. We're going to end the polling now. And I'm going to share the results. Here we go. The demand for Pepsi has shifted left. Now, this assumes people like Justin Bieber, right? So you got to remember the assumption here. People like Justin Bieber. They're running to buy Coca-Cola. So they could be just cool like him. Okay, um, so this is interesting, right? However, if people don't like Justin Bieber, it could be the opposite effect. 
people might start boycotting Coca-Cola and say, we don't like that guy. We're going to drink Pepsi now. So it's quite interesting, isn't it? From um, the assumption that is in our minds. So remember that assumptions could change your whole answer. Okay, but you guys have got that pretty well done. So well done, guys. Now let's do the next one. The next one is about the, the agriculture market. Imagine a fungal disease wipes out 20% of the tomato crop. What happens to the market for tomatoes, the supply and demand? Tomatoes or tomatoes? Who cares, right? But how does the market change? You decide. Tomatoes, tomatoes. Potatoes, potatoes. Hmm. You figure it out. How does it work? I'll give you some time to do this. Get your votes in. Keep going. You're doing good. Hmm. Okay, keep going everyone, you're doing good. All right, so we're gonna close up the voting in five seconds. Okay, here we go. I'm gonna share my results with you. Okay, so you guys have absolutely nailed it. Tomatoes shift to the left because some of that crop has been wiped out, so they cannot be supplied anymore. So well done, everyone. You've got those questions correct. Now, what I want to do next is we applied it in general now. Let's apply it to aviation next. Are you ready? So these are the answers just to confirm. All right, here we go. Think of the following situations now. The yellow one first, then the green, then the blue. Let's start with the yellow. Aircrafts are fully autonomous, pilotless in 2050. Let's imagine that. What will happen to the market for pilots? Okay, so I'm gonna put that poll up now for you to think about. Just think about it and you could put down your initial answer now. What happens to the market for pilots? Would we still need pilots or would we just not need them anymore? Or might the nature of pilots change? Some of them might be on the ground controlling a UAS. Who knows? The market would definitely change. Okay, so keep your answers coming in. Let's see how many of you get those correct. I was thinking about growing a mustache. Maybe not. Yeah, definitely not. Got to lose the mustache. Okay, I'll lose the mustache. Okay, you got five seconds, guys, while I lose the mustache. Okay, here we go. Um, let's go old school. Let's go old school because you probably don't know what this is. Okay, this is what TVs used to look like. All right, let's end the polling now. All right, we're going to share the results. So guys, what can you see from your answers? The demand for pilots has shifted left. That's right. 72% of you got that. But how left does it go? Does it go way left or does it go slightly left? That depends on the other factors too, such as will pilots be on the ground controlling the aircraft? Will there be, you know, like a UAS controller, which is also a pilot? Or will there be somebody in the cockpit anyway, just as a human override? Who knows? We just don't know. It's 2050, but we will get there and I'm sure we will all find out. Okay, so let's do the next one now, which is the poll number six. Um, I want you to think about the, the Indian domestic market now for flights. 
Okay, imagine 100 new airports are being built in India by 2030. What's going to happen? You can make your vote now. What do you think will happen to the Indian flight market, the domestic market? Lots of new airports being built in secondary, uh, secondary airports, different towns, different cities that previously did not have access to aviation. What's going to happen in this case? Okay, you figure it out. Okay, so that, that's a TV for anyone who doesn't know. Old school TVs look like that. There was a physical knob that you had to turn to for the volume and stuff. And you had to bang it on the side when the sound went off. It was really, really fun. Um, ah, gangster. This is gangster. This is cool. I, I, I like that look. Okay, let's go with the gangster look. Bandits. All right, so here we go, guys. End the poll now. Um, the majority of you have got this one right. 88% of you have said that the supply of domestic flights does increase. It does. It shifts to the right. Okay, so well, well done. You've got that. And um, I'm glad you're thinking about the first thing that happens because the first thing that happens is the airports are being built. When the airports are being built, you got more supply straight away. Demand will come in to meet that supply. Okay, so that's good that you thought about supply first because demand will follow, yes. Okay, so that, that was really nice. But what comes first, demand or supply? It's a bit like the chicken and egg situation. So I want you to think about that too. Does supply make demand or does demand make supply? There's two different schools of thoughts on this. There was a guy called Says, and Says is a famous economist. He said, supply, supply it and demand will come. For example, okay, like Dubai, for example. The Sheikh of Dubai says, build the world's tallest building and the tourists will come. Build Dubai Mall, the world's biggest mall, and the tourists will come. Just build it and they will come. Supply it, supply first, demand will follow. Okay, that's, I guess, something to think about in our answers, isn't it? All right, so let's move on to the last one here. A volcano erupts in Bali, Indonesia. What happens to the market for flights in and out of Bali? Imagine this volcano creates an ash cloud. What happens to the market for flights? Very interesting, this question. Think about it. Does supply change? Does demand change? Or does everything change? For the Bali flights coming in and out. Okay. F figure it out. Yeah. And there could be questions, yeah. There could be questions for this. Please put your questions in the Padlet, okay? And we'll take a look at that shortly. Um, so any doubts, we could clear those up. Okay, keep going. you got 10 seconds. Very interesting split, this one. All right, so let me just end the poll now. And as you can see, guys, it's a very interesting decision. It's a very split decision between the market collapses and disappears for a while or the supply of flight shift left. Now, actually, <laughs> these could all be correct. And that's what makes econ so cool. Econs is a, is a subject that makes debates happen because it's human behavior, it's social science, it's economy interacting. I think you all are right. The market does collapse for a while. It does disappear. For a while, there'll be no X. There'll be no diagram. It will, be, it will be gone. Supply will also shift to the left because imagine planes cannot take off and land. That means the flights will go way left. It might even go to zero. And the demand for flights will follow left as well because people will say, why go to Bali? There's an ash cloud over Bali that airspace there. So let's go to another vacation. Let's go to Sri Lanka, maybe, in the opposite direction. Okay, why not? So it's quite interesting. And some people said that there'll be no change to the market. Okay, but, um, but I think there will be a change and it could either be the top three answers. 
market collapses, supply of flight shift left, and then the demand will follow left as well, eventually. And the first thing that happens is the market will just go away. Okay, so yep, good answers guys. I really like your thinking and the way you are doing your analysis, right? It's really good. All right, so um, th these are the answers that I came up with and they are debatable, remember. Not 100% set in stone, okay? Now, if you look at aviation demand, <laughs> Aviation demand is very unique. It's very cyclical. It goes with the seasons. It goes with the, the, the holiday seasons, Christmas, Deepavali, Eid. You know, it does move up and down the demand and the seat is perishable. Once that flight takes off, that seat has gone forever. It cannot be sold. So let's go through these in a clockwise direction. And you will see aviation has some unique insights for demand. Leisures, leisure travelers are price sensitive. If the price goes up, they might reconsider their holiday. They might say, I don't want to book that ticket. Let me choose another destination. However, business travelers are time sensitive. They, they basically have to be at a meeting at a certain time, right? And there's competition from other modes. They could fly, they could take a boat, they could swim. And there's so many websites out there. There's so many new ways to book. Supply is very different too. Uh, um, you know, there's high labor costs, high investment costs, um, hubs are overlapping and so on. There are time lags between deliveries of planes and orders of planes and getting on a plane. It's always in the media, it's always in the news. So supply is really interesting too. So congratulations guys. You are now an aviation economics pro. Okay, so well done to you all. You've nailed it, just like this boy is showing us. But wait, guys, Corona, oh my God. How has that affected demand for flights? Everything has shifted left, okay? But how will we recover from this? Think about it, there'll be innovations, there'll be creativity, and we'll soon, see, see, soon have the markets opening up again. And there'll be new markets opening up, biofuels, hybrids, urban air mobility, so many things going on. So demand and supply will eventually bounce back to the right. We will move from A to B once this COVID situation is out and done. Okay, so um, I want to I share this right with, with you now. Let, let us share your actual answers from your Padlet. So quick sharing, here we go. So questions. Um, the aviation industry is interesting. Yes, it is. And can you start your own airline? Yes, you can, but you need that capital because it is a high capital intensive industry. So you need lots of money to start up basically. Um, and some of you want to um, aspire to become a pilot. You, even if you're colorblind, there are ways that, um, let me check. I don't think so actually, but I can check that if you, if you are colorblind, but I don't think so at the moment. And uh, you got lots of questions about what age can you become a pilot and what you have to do to prepare. Now, these are questions that Christy and Kelvin could definitely help answer because they are dealing with students just like you on a daily basis. And they will definitely get back to you on that. Now, how do you feel? Some people are thrilled. Some people are excited. Some people are quite confused. Um, that I like the Gunners <laughs> when Manchester is a better team. <laughs> Yes, yes, and excited and amazed, right? And um, I'm so happy that you guys have all enjoyed and contributed to my Padlet. This Padlet is still open, so feel free to revisit even after the session. You could even still add your stuff and I can still see it. So this conversation is not ending right here, okay? And you love aviation, guys and it takes over your studies. Some of you want to add me to LinkedIn. As you can see, I'm hipster. I'm not on LinkedIn. I'm so old school, man. Um, <laughs> but um, it's really, really nice of you guys to really consider that. And I really appreciate it. So um, I, I think you guys have all done really well today. And um, I've, I've really had fun to, to actually be here to interact with all of you. And I want you to remember one thing, okay? For aviation, the sky is not the limit, really. And um, there's so many opportunities. Supersonic flights, for example, you know, like the, just the Concorde previously. Virgin Galactic, SpaceX, for example, you know, these are, these are things put down by Elon Musk, the famous innovator. 
from Tesla. And then you've got urban air mobility, transforming the way we will go to work or to school one day. So things are really changing. Things are really developing. And um, I've got a quick video here to show you, and I'm going to end on this video. So just enjoy this while you can, okay? I just want to show you this video. And um, I, I just want to, uh, because it's very, very interesting. Here we go. Tell me the one about the virus again. Then I'll go to bed. But my boy, you're growing weary, sleepy thoughts about your head. Please, that one's my favourite. I promise just once more. Okay, snuggle down, my boy, though I know you know full well. The story starts before then, in a world I once would dwell. It was a world of waste and wonder, of poverty and plenty, back before we understood why hindsight's twenty twenty. You see, the people came up with companies to trade across all lands, but they swelled and got much bigger than we ever could have planned. We'd always had our wants, but now it got so quick. You could have anything you dreamed of in a day, and with a click. We noticed families had stopped talking. That's not to say they never spoke, but the meaning must have melted, and the work-life balance broke, and the children's eyes grew squarer and every toddler had a phone. They filtered out the imperfections, but amidst the noise, they felt alone. And every day the skies grew thicker, till you couldn't see the stars. So we flew in planes to find them, while down below, we filled our cars. We'd drive around all day in circles. We'd forgotten how to run. We swapped the grass for tarmac, shrunk the parks till there were none. We filled the sea with plastic, because our waste was never capped. Until each day when you went fishing, you'd pull them out, already wrapped. And while we drank and smoked and gambled, our leaders taught us why. It's best to not upset the lobbies, more convenient to die. But then in 2020, a new virus came our way. The governments reacted and told us all to hide away. But while we all were hidden, amidst the fear and all the while, the people dusted off their instincts. They remembered how to smile. They started clapping to say thank you and calling up their mums. And while the car keys gathered dust, they would look forward to their runs. And with the skies less full of voyagers, the earth began to breathe. And the beaches bore new wildlife that scuttled off into the seas. Some people started dancing, some were singing, some were baking. We'd grown so used to bad news, but some good news was in the making. And so when we found the cure, and were allowed to go outside, we all preferred the world we found to the one we'd left behind. Old habits became extinct, and they made way for the new. And every simple act of kindness was now given its due. But why did it take a virus to bring the people back together? Well, sometimes you've got to get sick, my boy, before you start feeling better. Now lie down and dream of tomorrow and all the things that we can do. And who knows, if you dream hard enough, maybe some of them will come true. We now call it the Great Realisation. And yes, since then there have been many. But that's the story of how it started and why hindsight's 2020. Okay, interesting stuff, isn't it, guys? So, um, what I want to do with you is a quick poll to end, okay? So, um, I, I want you to um, have, have a look at this. Um, have, have a look at this one now, just to reflect on the video. It's a very deep video. And let's see how you are feeling after watching that video. So, you could give me your answers now. A lot of rhyming in that video. It started off really, you know, it's a had negative and then it kind of changed its mood and then it really came to today, showed the benefit of what we're going through, how it brought us closer together, how we learned new skills. And um, it was a really interesting video that. I really like that. I think it's a powerful message. So let's see how you felt about it. 
Okay, I'll give you a few seconds to finish up. Okay, in five seconds, I will share the results with you, okay? Here we go, all right. Let's share the results. The majority of you um, are uplifted by that video. Yes, it, it is an uplifting video. It started off a bit sad, a bit scary sometimes, but then it really got uplifting towards the middle and the end. So that is what I wanna leave you with, guys. I, I know that life is scary right now. I know that things are changing. Um, this is something that we've never lived through in our lifetimes. Uh, we've never been through a war, for example, like World War I, World War II, and now we've come to Corona. This is what you will be telling your grandkids. Okay, so, you, so you're living through it, you're surviving it, and you're thriving through it. So remember, you could achieve some great things in your life. So remember, guys, I want you to end on this note here. Keep calm and just fly like an eagle, and you will achieve great things. Thank you, guys. Dr. Patel, I'm out. It's a pleasure meeting you. To you, Kelvin. Thanks so much, Jack. That was awesome. It was really, really interesting. It's amazing how interactive you made it. And you actually made economics very enjoyable for me as well. Same here. <laughs> I'm happy. <laughs> We're breaking the myth that economics is boring. We're making it fun. We're making it hands-on. We're making it applicable. And I'm sure, I hope that everybody has good feedback on the tablet as well from the students. <laughs> I see a few hands raised. Do you guys have questions for Dr. Jack? If you do... Um, you could type then... it on the, the Padlet too, and, and, and I could actually get back to them offline. Sure. Sure, yeah. yeah. You can leave mm -hmm. your questions for Dr. Mm -hmm. Jack on the Padlet. If you have questions for us regarding admissions, degree programs, um, you know, uh, careers uh, that you're looking for in the aviation aerospace industry, then just stay on with us and uh, we'll be happy to answer all of your questions. So thank you, Dr. Jack. And uh, if I you'd like to sign that. out, you can. And before that, I think can we all take a Zoom group photo? <laughs> Since you are here, yeah. Well, if you guys want to, uh, I think you can put on your video. Let me see whether you're able to do that. If yeah, if not, if not, just show some reaction. Put out your hands, all right? Hey guys. And yeah. Raise it for supply and demand, everyone. Yeah, make sure you do not shift too much to left <laughs> or right. <laughs> All right, so, so everyone, uh, let's get ready. Okay, I will take the shot in three, two, and one. All right, cool. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Cheers, That's guys. Thanks for being... Thanks for being a great host and being a great audience as well. You guys are fantastic. I really enjoyed it today. And I could go on for another hour easily. <laughs> but you don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, Raghav, can I help you? You can unmute yourself if you'd like. And you can ask us your question. Um, we will also make the chat box now open for everybody. So if you'd like to just type it in to the chat box, that's possible too. Srini, you're the other person who has your hand raised. Do you have a question for us? Can we get a recording of this lecture? Um, we do record all of our sessions. At some point, we are going to be uh, sharing a link for this session with you guys. So yeah, you will be able to access it. Um, it will be shared on a resource page connected to our website.
Sakshi, thank you for your question. I'm not really sure. Um, we do have a lot of research projects that our students undertake. Um, and I, um, I don't know about each and every one of them. I can, I'm, I'll be happy to pass you a link to our research projects, which are listed on our website. Um, quite a few of them are extremely interesting. Um, I don't know if you're going to find one directly related to what you're specifically asking, transport aircraft with a separable capsule. Um, I'm not sure about that, but you could have a look at similar or various other research projects that our students have undertaken over the years and uh, stuff that they're doing currently. Um, hi, Ashish. Um, MS in aviation required to become a pilot in India? Uh, no, um, and um, honestly, we don't offer, um, the degree that we offer is not called an MS in aviation. It's called uh, a Master of Science in Aeronautics. It's not an absolute requirement, no. Um, well, it depends on what you want to do in terms of a career in aviation, really. Uh, what kind of a career are you looking for? What kind of um, jobs you want to do? Um, and based on that, you will decide whether you need a master's or not. For instance, if you want to go into further research or you want to do something in innovation, um, then a master of uh, science in aeronautics might be really, really helpful and useful for you. So um, we, we can definitely schedule a separate call, uh, a one-on-one -on -one personalized counseling and advising session for you where you can talk about your career goals, your uh, educational background, and then we can let you know uh, what exact, which are the degree programs you should be looking at, uh, what are the qualifications that you might want to consider further. Um, and um, you can make an informed decision based on our discussion. Does that work for you? Um, if it does, then just feel free to drop us an email. Kelvin, if you can just share our contact uh, slide okay. on, um, and uh, we, 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 we're sharing our email address with you. Just drop us an email and we will make sure that we get back to you and schedule a Zoom call um, so that we can then talk to you about your um, future plans. Um, what are the courses and degrees to be an airline pilot? Um, hi, Chamat. All right. Um, so if you are planning on becoming a pilot, what you're looking to essentially study is aeronautics um, or aeronautical science. Um, and um, these are typically three and a half year, four year degrees. Um, you can, if you want to, do your pilot training with Embry-Riddle. Um, you may or may not know that Embry-Riddle actually has one of the world's largest flight training programs. We own more than 50 aircraft that you can see on our campus at the flight line. Um, so it is possible for students to do their degree program and then do their um, flight training and actually complete their commercial pilot license while doing the degree at Embry-Riddle. So if Becoming a pilot is your dream if that's what you always wanted to do and that, if that's what you're really passionate about, then you can definitely um, talk to us about doing the Bachelor of Science in Aeronautics uh, with us and then doing the flight training with us. We, we can share the detailed breakup of um, the costs um, and based on that, you can then go on to apply. Um, I'm not sure which grade you are in right now, but and how much time you have before you start the application process. But the earlier you start planning all of this, the better, uh, particularly the budgets for it, because flight training can often be expensive. Um, so again, as I, as I mentioned, do drop us an email. And because this is, this is a more of a, a longer discussion and we need to have a very detailed discussion with you about the various options you have because you have more than one option that you can choose from in terms of whether you study at our US campus, whether you choose our Singapore campus, etc. So we'll be happy to schedule a call with you. Do in invite your parents over for the call as well so that we can then jointly uh, discuss your future. 
Um, the next questions are all about CPL training. Yes, you can complete your commercial pilot license uh, while doing your degree at Embry-Riddle. Embry-Riddle is not a flying school, please note. So you can't just do your flying uh, flight training and your licenses with us. You are going to be enrolled in a degree program as a student who's studying um, a degree with us. And while you are doing that, um, along with that, you can also do your flight training and get your licenses. Hi, Taufik. You're most welcome. Uh, we are so thankful to you for joining us today. Um, and thank you for saying that um, you enjoyed and appreciated the session. Uh, COVID updates on the application process at Embry-Riddle. Uh, the um, application process at Embry-Riddle remains similar to what it used to be. Um, it's largely, um, it's almost completely online. So that kind of makes it easy for students to continue to apply with us and complete the entire application process online. Um, all you need to do is go to our website, erau.edu and um, fill in and submit the online application form, pay the application fee, um, and then we will get in touch with you from the admissions office. We will send you a checklist of all the documents that you must submit in order to complete your application. Um, and we will basically help you throughout every step of the process. Um, so if you have any concerns or any questions regarding any one particular step about being able to send us your transcripts or your um, test score results, etc., then you can definitely get in touch with us and we can help you out and we can tell you what options you have. Um, typically, we are a test optional school, so you do not need your SATs as a compulsory part of your application. And that kind of makes it easier as well during this time of COVID. Um, um, I hope that answers your question, Jay. But if you have any specific questions, just feel free to ask. Um, hi, Keshavi. I wanted to ask, can a commerce student become a pilot? Yes, uh, you don't necessarily have to be from the science background in order to become a pilot. We do have a few students, uh, international students, who studied commerce and then ended up applying for a Bachelor of Science in Aeronautics program and want to train to become pilots. That's absolutely possible. However, you need to truly be passionate about aeronautics, which means that you need to be ready to put in a lot of extra work on your math and your physics. Those are two critical subjects that you're going to use um, somewhat um, extensively during your degree program, uh, particularly when you're studying courses like aerodynamics. And um, so for that, um, you need to have somewhat of a background in physics and math. Um, if they weren't your favorite subjects in school, then I'd recommend that you start brushing up on that a little bit, getting some additional help. And, um, and it, uh, once, you're, once you're confident about putting in your best, trying really hard, you should be fine. And um, we, can, we can definitely help you um, improve your, um, your um, strength in those subjects. So that's, that's the only requirement, really. There's nothing else preventing commerce students from becoming pilots. Hi, Howard. It's so good to see you. Thank you for joining us today. It's great that you all could, jo could join us in the evening. It's, I saw a few more of our students joining in today. Thank you, all of you who joined in. It was really great to see you guys show up and show support for this session. We really appreciate it. Is aeronautical engineering different? from aerospace engineering? Only slightly, yes. Uh, aerospace engineering is broader in its scope um, in terms of the fact that it will include not just aircraft, but all kinds of spacecraft. Um, it, it includes uh, various aspects of engineering, including propulsion, structures and materials, dynamics and control. So uh, you would be, um, 
you would develop broader skills, let's just say. And the engineering program we offer at Embry-Riddle is an aerospace engineering program. It's a four-year program. Um, you could do it at our campuses in Daytona Beach, Florida, or Prescott, Arizona. If you want more information about it, we'll be happy to get you all the information you need. Um, so do send us, send us an email and we will definitely um, follow up with uh, more information and links from our website that you can read up and do some more research and understand it better. Um, my query is regarding transcripts. Hi, she Seema. Um, since universities are not fully functioning, any alternatives to submitting transcripts? Right, Seema. Um, well, since you say universities are not currently functioning, I assume that you are currently doing your bachelor's degree program or you've just completed your bachelor's degree program and you're looking to do a master's uh, program with Embry-Riddle. Um, I do understand the, uh, the frustration and the, the difficulty with getting your transcripts for, and collecting it from the university offices considering that it's all closed and most universities are still working remotely. Uh, what you can um, hope to do is um, you can um, send us unofficial copies for now, which means that you can just scan and send us uh, the transcripts that you currently have with you. Um, and then, and we, we will um, basically file those and uh, we will use that to make a provisional admission offer. What that basically means is that we will evaluate and assess your um, application and decide uh, whether uh, we are ready to make an admission decision based on that. And we will let you know our um, admission decision. But the final admission decision uh, will be handed to you uh, once you are able to submit your final transcripts, which you can do any time before you actually start the degree program, before you start the course, all right? Um, I will check on this with admissions as well in case there have been any further changes, um, but I, I don't think so. Um, and if there are any other options for you, we can definitely let you know about that too. Uh, we will send you a general email after this session. And uh, if you could just follow up and uh, ask us this question one more time, then I can connect you with our admissions office as well on email. Um, do Ember riddle provide internship or co-op opportunities at NASA? Well, we do have quite a few students who are doing co-ops and internships at NASA. Again, if you go to our website, erau.edu, and you do a search for research projects and internships, um, you will find a lot of this information already available on our website. Um, if you look at our brochures as well, and we can definitely send you a copy, um, NASA is one of the bigger employers who constantly um, hire students from us, uh, both for full-time positions as well as internships. Um, so yes, we do have quite a few students um, from Embry-Riddle who are doing um, you know, contractual work or uh, co-ops or internships with NASA. Thanks for that question, Jay. Mm -hmm. um, TOEFL, uh, yeah, we have questions here on TOEFL or else, right? So yep. basically, yeah. Uh, for us, if you have uh, done a study in the, you know, for more than two years, okay, uh, in a school where the medium of instruction, the language of instruction is English, uh, then we will not require you to submit any TOEFL or the IELTS, the IELTS score. If not, okay, uh, you need to achieve at least a 79 for the internet-based test for the TOEFL or uh, overall band of uh, 6.0 okay, for the IELTS. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, also, you're asking about, I saw a question here, the email and contact number from WhatsApp. Well, on the screen right now, we have our contact information. You can see the email address. Uh, it's just fourth on the list here, okay, right at the bottom. Uh, we do not have any contact number for WhatsApp at the moment. But, you know, if you could just email, drop us an email with your question, we will we'll try to get back to you, you know, as soon as we can, right? So if not, you can try giving us a call if you want to speak to someone, right? 
What are the minimum IB scores required? Hey, okay, that's a good question, Jay. Um, now I know you're from an IB school. Um, <laughs> so the minimum IB score required is 30, but it depends on the degree program that you're applying for. For different degree programs, we have different cutoff scores, okay, guys? So um, uh, for most of our programs, if you have a score of 30, then you are eligible to apply. It is by no means a guarantee for admission, but it, you can definitely apply with a score of 30. But for some of our more rigorous, some of our more academically intensive programs like engineering, whether it's aerospace or mechanical, civil, electrical, computer, software engineering, um, some of, for some of our space programs like astrophysics, astronomy, space physics, engineering physics, we would like you to have definitely a higher IB score, and I would recommend a score of 36 or above, at least a 36 or above. Also, it's very important for you to have physics and math as IB subjects. They don't have to be HL subjects. They can be SL subjects, and that's perfectly fine as well. But we do expect you to have uh, them as um, your SL or HL subjects, and we expect you to score a five or higher for your physics and math. If you have below five, then we would be a little concerned about your proficiency in those subjects. All right. Yes, after doing an aeronautical engineering degree at the bachelor's level, you can do a master of science in aerospace engineering. You can, yes. You will also have to submit a GRE score. And you need to have a very strong GPA in your bachelor's in aer aeronautical engineering. Okay. If you want to discuss that further, please feel free to email me. Um, I'm happy to talk to you about what the exact requirements are for our Master of Science in Aerospace Engineering program. It's a two-year program at the Daytona Beach, Florida campus, one of our most popular um, and really intensive, rigorous uh, programs, but a brilliant program to get into. You're most welcome, Shima. Most welcome, Cannadale. Uh, Jay, you're back again. <laughs> Which degree would be best to pursue at Ember Riddle to become an astronaut? But you do have a choice, Jay. You can, you can do um, a degree in aerospace engineering, for instance, or you could do a degree in astrophysics, astronomy, space physics. So what I recommend you do is um, you should go to our website and look at the degree program section. All right, that's our website. And um, sorry, if you look at our degree program section and if you click, if you filter your search for space programs, you will see all of these programs pop up. What I would like you to do is open all of them on different windows. And we have very, very detailed pages for each of our degree programs. It lists every course that you will do during the entire four year duration of the degree program, what that program is about, what are your specializations, what kind of careers you do or you have after you've completed. Um, so have a look at all that information, do your research, do your homework first, read a lot. And after that, I'm sure you will have better clarity about what you want to do. Um, see which program makes, makes it look the most exciting, makes, uh, which program you feel the most passionate about. And that will help you decide which one you wanna do. If you're still confused, no problems, schedule a meeting with us. Uh, by just emailing us and we will be happy to have a discussion with you where we could talk to you about the differences and similarities and what your options are and then you can decide from there onwards. All right. I hope this helps everybody. Um, that was a lot of really great questions. Thank you guys. Your participation really makes this worth it. All right, so it's been almost an extra 30 minutes. Sure. <laughs> so um, we, we, are, we are going to be uh, scheduling a lot more sessions as we go along throughout uh, the months of October and November as well. So if you do have more questions for us and you want to catch us again, 
it's not a problem. You can join us for any of those sessions or you can just schedule a personalized one-on-one -on -one counseling session or information session um, and we'll be happy to help you out. Um, I thank you with all my heart, you guys, for joining us today, for taking this time to be with us. I hope that you enjoyed the session and had as much fun as I did. And I hope to see you for many future sessions here onwards. Over to you, Kelvin. Right before I end this, I see, uh, yep, you guys can follow us on social media. We will be posting updates uh, on all our events and activities and our future series like what we have today. So you can just follow us and you'll be able to get, you know, notification every time we post something. Uh, or you can always check out our website, okay, uh, every now and then to find those updates. So, um, yeah, you will be getting, uh, if you have registered for the session, yeah, you should be receiving emails from us later on uh, with links to the recordings. Uh, do give us some time, okay, so we can prepare the video and upload them so that you can view them later on. All right, so with that, I think uh, we'll be ending this now. So uh, once again, thanks uh, those who stay with us to you know, this late. Uh, yeah, we enjoy your participation and the questions. So the last slide, I'll move it back to our contact information. Okay? If you have not taken that down, please do that now. Okay? So you can always just get back to us, uh, send us an email if you have any questions. All right, so with that, I'll say goodbye everyone. Good evening, good night. <laughs> All right, thank you. Bye guys. Have a great evening. Take care and stay safe. Bye.